major global, global events planned to come to our city um, instead of struggling to meet basic needs. The city has an opportunity now to ensure that garment workers are able to make living wages while meeting the apparel needs for the Olympic Games and um, that tourism workers make a living wage as tourism uh, increases in the city. We're calling on you to do everything in your power to make sure this policy moves forward in this committee so it can be brought back to council without further delay. Workers have been waiting for years since this was introduced and while the cost of living continues to climb, wages have not kept up. We'll keep coming back until it passes. Thank you. Thank you. Finn Keenan, what item would you like to be heard on? Uh, hi, my name is Finn Keenan. I'm speaking on raising the wage for tourism workers. All right, you have one minute. Go ahead. Uh, I'm a UCLA student with Clue Justice, and um, I'm speaking regarding this policy because uh, we think that advancing the rights of workers and ensuring that workers have a living wage and can live in Los Angeles is crucial to creating beloved community for all in Los Angeles. Uh, we stood alongside tourism workers policy was introduced almost a year ago, and since last year, the cost of groceries, rent, and health care continues to rise. It's time to move this policy forward. We're urging, we're urging you to, con to prioritize scheduling this policy in this committee to ensure that it goes back to council as soon as possible. We hope we can count on your full support. We'll keep coming back until it passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. Glendana Miranda, and then Laura Esquivel and Maria Mar Mar Romero will be next. Glendana Miranda, going once, going twice. All right, Laura Esquivel. Laura Esquivel, going once, going twice. Okay. Hi, Ms. Esquivel, what would you like to be heard on? Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Laura Esquivel y soy janitor por 22 años, trabajo en el aeropuerto, 18 años trabajé limpiando aviones y llevo cuatro. It's off. Hello, I am Laura Esquivel working as a janitor for 18 years, and I've been cleaning uh, restrooms and the airports for 20. All right, one minute, thanks, go ahead. Tengo cuatro años más ahora de janitor, y he venido aquí para apoyar a mis compañeros, y nosotros somos de USWW. Yes, I have been working for four years more as a janitor, and I'm here to support my coworkers from USWW. Trabajar en una industria donde las aerolíneas y los contratistas ganan millones, pero no pagan un sueldo digno para nosotros. Working in an industry where the bosses are making millions, but they cannot afford to pay us a digni uh, dignified wage. Nos impacta porque no nos alcanza para todos los servicios médicos y dentales que nuestras familias necesitan which impacts us uh, significantly because we are unable to pay for our medical wages and uh, dental wages that we need to take care of our families. Debido a estos sueldos bajos, me encuentro en una situación muy difícil. El año pasado, tuve que ir al dentista por mi hija. Uh, because of these uh, low wages, I have found myself in a difficult situation uh, because last year I had to go uh, to the dentist for my daughter tuvo un problema y era de que lo tenía que hacer ya. El costo de ese programa y de lo que me cubría mi seguro médico eran solo cientos de dólares. Por lo tanto, tenía que pagar cuatro mil dólares por ese tratamiento. Uh, last year she had a uh, urgent, um, she had something that she had to take care of urgently and the cost of it uh, was four thousand dollars and my uh, policy only took care of one hundred. Dollars. Por eso tenía que decidir entre pagar mi renta, comer o hacer eso que era importante para mi hija. And I had to decide between paying my rent or eating or doing that which was so crucial for my daughter. Es algo que nos pasa a muchos de nosotros porque en realidad el sueldo que ganamos no nos alcanza. It's something that happens to many of us because the truth is that the wages that we are earning is not enough for us. Por eso vengo aquí 
a solicitar. I think we're out of time. Thank you, Ms. Esquivel. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Mar you're welcome. Maria Romero? What item would you like to be heard on? Hello, everyone. My name is Mar Maria Romero. I have worked at LAX for 17 years, Terminal 1. All right, one minute, please. Go ahead. OK, thank you. I am I am proud member of SEIU, USWW. I'm here because raising the wage of the, for the airport workers is extremely important to me and my family. I support my family as well as my parents and siblings. It is hard to live in LA when the cost of rent keeps going up. We need to invest in the workers that makes the economy run every day. The airport is receiving billions of dollars to renovate renovation, but what about the workers? We can be left behind. We are calling on you to do everything in your power to make sure this policy moves forward this committee and thank you for your time. Thank you. Maria Vasquez, come on up. Which item would you like to be heard on? General comment. All right, you've got one minute, go ahead. All right, uh, my name is Maria Vasquez and I work at LAX and I'm a proud member at SEU USW. I've lived in the city of Los Angeles and I've seen so many um, living costs going up since then, um, last year. And we were told since last year we were gonna get at least a minimum wage uh, increase. Our increase hasn't gone since then, and it has affected us a lot since we go daily basis to our work as regularly employers. Um, our checks, we go paycheck to paycheck. It doesn't make any needs. Our rents have gone higher and you know it has pushed us to move out a state or cities and we really enjoy working in the community for LAX but we need our increase now thank you thank you Marvin Portillo come on up what would you like to be heard on I try in Spanish sorry um, Hola, estoy aquí. Mi nombre es Marvin Portillo. En comentarios generales, ustedes. Eh. Sorry. Hi, my name is Marvin Portillo, here for general public comment. Great. One minute. Go ahead. Uh, soy trabajador de SkyChef por más de 11 años y estoy orgulloso de pertenecer a United Heat 11. Yes, I am uh, proud to participate here for UNWW, having been working here for 11 years. La política de aumentar salarios a los trabajadores de turismo se introdujo uh, casi más de un año. Después de eso, el costo de todo ha subido. Estoy luchando por pagar mis cuentas. Yes, this policy has been introduced uh, one year ago, and since then the costs have gone up, and I am still struggling to get by. Me preocupa perder eh, mi casa, mi alquiler, eh, también poder pagar mis alimentos y mis biles. Aunque tengo seguro médico, eh, si caigo gravemente, no pudiera ir al doctor. I am scared of losing my house, not being able to pay rent and not being able to pay my bills. And I am also scared of being ill and my health uh, not being up to par uh, because of the high cost of health care. Esta política es esencial para resolver esta crisis. Hemos estado esperando bastante. Le pedimos que hagan todo lo posible al alcance de sus manos. This policy is crucial. Uh, for all of us, and I ask, please, please do everything within your power. Uh, por favor, vean esto eh, y devuélvalo al consejo sin demora. Y por supuesto, podamos resolver con todo su apoyo uh, la urgencia para nuestros trabajadores y compañeros. Please give this back. Uh, we need uh, your support uh, for the sake of myself and for my for my coworkers. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. No, Hemi Woods. And then Sheldon Taylor is the last person on my list. So, Nohimi Woods. Hi, which item would you like to be heard on? Buenas tardes. Okay, one minute, go ahead. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Glenda Miranda. He trabajado en la compañía Fly Food Group durante seis años. 
y soy un miembro orgulloso de United Local 11. Mi trabajo consiste en... Yes, hello, I'm Glenda Miranda. I've been working for a flag food group for six years, and I am a proud member of the United 11. Mi trabajo consiste en preparar comida para aerolíneas internacionales en el aeropuerto de Los Ángeles. My job consists of preparing food for uh, the airlines in uh, the LAX airport. La política de aumentar los salarios de los, tra eh, de los trabajadores del turismo se introdujo hace un año en la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Vivo con mi madre, mi hijo, en un pequeño departamento. Yeah, this policy has been introduced uh, a year ago, and I live uh, at home with my mother and a son in a small apartment. Eh, el salario no nos permite eh, obtener un lugar más amplio para tener una mejor calidad de vida debido al salario bajo que tenemos nosotros los trabajadores de las cocinas en el aeropuerto. Uh, this salary does not permit us to uh, live in a bigger uh, dwelling place uh, due to the, the low salary that is paid for the kitchen workers. Mis compañeros y yo salimos hace un año a huelga exigiendo a la compañía un mejor salario para una vida digna aquí en la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Uh, me and my coworkers have been on strike for a year so that we can have, uh, so that we can live with dignity. Nosotros los trabajadores de las compañías de cocina le pedimos a ustedes eh, que nos, eh, oh, perdón, sorry. Le pedimos, dice, a ustedes que hagan todo lo posible para que esta para asegurarse de que esta política avance en este comité para que se pueda devolver al consejo sin más demora y que nosotros los trabajadores de las cocinas, tanto del turismo, tengamos una vida digna y un salario digno. Gracias. We ask for you guys to let this pass uh, without further delays so that all of us here, my coworkers, can all uh, live with dignity and with higher wages. Thank you. Thank you. Sheldon Taylor, what would you like to be heard on? Some general comment. All right, you have one minute. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councilman, for listening to me today. Um, my name is Sheldon Taylor. I've worked at LAX for 33 years. I'm a proud member of SEIU USWW. I have dedicated my life, my work, and it shows in my years of working as a faggot runner. I am here today because it is time that we raise the wage for workers, workers who make the airport run. And I just also want to say, you know, to make ends meet, I have to go to food banks. You know, I'll be 64 in May. And this raise, they helped me a lot because as you know, contract workers, we don't have no retirement plan. So this will help me a lot, to, you know, so I can live in dignity. You know, like whenever I retire and then there's a look, I'm gonna have to work to at least I'm 70. And um, LA is preparing for the Olympics and the World Cup. We need to put workers in the forefront. We are calling on YouTube for everything to make the power to make sure the policy moves forward in this committee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Today. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Okay, is there anyone who didn't sign up who would like to offer comment? I am the meeting notes to come uh, earlier. Oh, okay, good. What would you like to be heard on? I'm doing a uh, public comment. Okay, you have one minute, go ahead. All right, um, the Rest Opportunity Center stands in solidarity with hotel and LX workers. Um, we know the Olympics is a priority for the city. Much thought and preparation is going into it. Welcome back, Chairwoman Tracy Park from the Olympic delegations to Paris and Tokyo. With all the investment going into our city for the Olympics, this committee has an opportunity to make sure the workers who are the backbone of the tourism industry are not left behind. Hospitality workers join the Tourism Workers Rising Coalition because we understand how hard it is to live in LA right now, and their struggle reflects ours. When people are not able to afford to live where they work, we lose not only whole communities <coughs> and businesses, but also culture and diversity. The people that make LA LA are at risk of not being able to live in their own cities. This is not only unfair, but also deeply disturbing. So we're asking for your support here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woods. Is there anyone else who did not sign up that wishes to give public comment? Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment. And we will get started with our agenda. Um, thank you all for being here today.
Unless there is any objection from my colleagues, I would like to move items eight through 22 on consent. Mr. McCosker. I have no objection, but I do have uh, an amendment, a small amendment for item 19, if I could read that. Okay. So I would have the moving clause on item 19 read, I therefore move that the city council request the city, the office of the city attorney with the assistance of the CAO and then add the language and the Bureau of Contract Administration and the coordination of stop addition. The remainder remains the same. The Department of Civil Rights uh, and Equity Department to report back and the rest of it is unchanged. It's just the addition of and the Bureau of Contract Administration and the coordination of. Okay, and I will second that. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Soto Martinez, anything? Nope. Okay, then if we would, I would, why don't we go ahead and just take item 19 first then? And I'd like to approve that as amended by Council Member McCosker. If you would, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Park? Yes. McCosker? Yes. Soto Martinez? Yes. Three ayes and the item has been approved as amended. Okay, thank you. If I could um, then go ahead and call the roll for items eight through 18 and 20 through 2022, 20, please. Park? Yes. McCoster? Yes. Soto Martinez? Yes. Those items have now been approved. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so that will bring us back to item number one. Mr. Clerk, if you would please read the item for us. Item number one, Los Angeles World Airport's quarterly update. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clerk, and welcome back, Mr. Ackerman. We're happy to see you in your no new role, and we are looking forward to your update today. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Park. I think you forgot to uh, press that button on your, on your thing. There All you right. Go. One new guy mistake. Thank you very much, Vice Chair McCosker, for the. I do it once a meeting. For the, <laughs> I'll try to not do it twice today. Uh, so it's my pleasure to return to the Travel, Trade, and Tourism Com Committee and to present on Los Angeles World Airports. Uh, for the past uh, month and a half since since I joined the airport, I've been busy getting familiar with the many projects, people, and stakeholders that are critical at LAWA, including have a great meeting uh, with you, Chair Park. I met hundreds of our employees at workplaces and offices at LAX and Van Nuys including airport police officers, bus drivers, custodial crews, employees across our finance, uh, information technology, administrative, internal operations, and, and so many more. I've also spent uh, uh, the better part of a day touring Van Nuys, uh, learning the airfield, and, and really seeing that incredible asset uh, that we have in the Valley. And I, I find that we do our best work when we are engaging our people and talking through problems. As I remind our staff, and this has been a, a saying of mine for a while, you know, in, in our airport office building, it's not an airport. There's there's no terminal, there's no runways, there's no airplanes, there's no customers. Uh, so it, it's just a building. The, the real airport is outside. Uh, so I spend uh, as much time as possible outside of my office. Uh, uh, you know, you can call it management by walking around, but I really do like to get out and, and talk to the people who are actually doing the work and see for myself the conditions uh, that, that our team members face and that all of our stakeholders face. Uh, you know, and we're doing this while also doing the, the policy and strategy work to, to drive the airport forward as leaders. Uh, and, and since uh, for a, a big part of my career, and, and certainly here, I, I've had a mantra that it's really it's people, people, people. Uh, you know, I've told my team members that I you know, generally wake up in the morning thinking about a, a people issue. Uh, I spend a plurality of, of my day at work discussing people and talent and, and how that applies to, to the business. Uh, and I generally go to bed, uh, again, thinking about uh, a people and, and a people issue. And as I went through the, the search process and the, and the confirmation process, I, I heard many times about the $30 billion uh, that we are investing uh, in our airport system uh, on behalf of uh, the, the citizens of this city. Uh, and that's incredibly important. Uh, and it was something that was very attractive for me in, in, in taking this role. Uh, but as we invest in our facilities, we also have to invest in our people. Uh, and, and I think that uh, in my observation, I'm not sure we have the balance right, candidly, uh, at LAWA. And I've, I've challenged my teammates with rethinking that, that balance of facilities and, and people. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for the support of, of Mayor Bass and for the Board of Air Airport Commissioners uh, on that as well. So uh, we're, we're currently reviewing what we can do to achieve our staffing goals. It's, it's an, not, not a, a walk-up secret that we're, our staffing is down like many of the, my fellow departments uh, in the city. 
Uh, and that short staffing takes a, a significant toll on the team members who remain. Uh, they're, they're still trying to do the work and, and serve our customers and serve our stakeholders. So I'm personally invested in, in finding uh, solutions uh, for, for restoring our staff to its, its full strength and really its full potential. And because I really feel like it, unless we can do that, we really can't be a world-class airport unless we're also a world-class employer uh, for our team and for, all, for the entire community, not, not just for, for the employees that, that work for me. Uh, and since I've started, I've, I've been incredibly impressed uh, with the, the creativity, the intelligence, uh, the dedication of the employees. So I, I know I know we can get there, uh, but but we're going to need we're going to need some help uh, in in speaking with with some of you and speaking with the mayor and our board. Uh, it was also really impressed upon me, and, and I, I really this mission means a lot to me. That as we as we execute our mission and we and we spend all of this money, and it's it's a lot of money. It has to benefit the entire community, uh, and historically, I, I think it hasn't. So we're working very hard uh, to, to broaden the benefit to the community. And, and I think if, uh, if some of you saw, a, uh, I don't know you're going to consider this soon, uh, but if you saw our most recent uh, BOAC meeting, we went through a, a MATOC uh, process, and I'm going I'm to multiple award task order contract. I believe I've got that right. I called it something different at, at my old place, so I'm, I'm learning the new term. But that that award uh, brought it's 15 prime contracts, uh, four large firms, five medium firms, six small firms, and all of whom went through an extensive outreach process and participated in the RFP process. But I think it, it's hard to, to overstate the the difference in that procurement. It would have been far easier, candidly, to select one or two or three firms, give them large contracts. It's easier to manage, easier to control. It's probably faster, more efficient in some ways. Uh, but it, it wouldn't bring the, the rich diversity of ideas and experience uh, to the table. Uh, so the team, and this predates me, I, I just simply had to present this a couple of weeks ago, uh, but they spent more than a year really thinking critically about how to do a procurement differently than it had ever been done before at DFW. And the result of that, you know, it's great to have ideas and think creatively, but results matter. And the results are of those 15 firms, six of them are first time primes uh, or new to the airport. I mean, so so almost half of them had never had these opportunities before. Two of them are joint venture XBEs that are new to Lawa that had never worked before. So we're actually seeing fresh ideas and, and fresh, fresh fresh participation from the community uh, in these opportunities. And you know that that is one set of contracts. We have we have a lot more to go, but to have that uh, you know happen in the first couple of weeks, and for me to see the the, the really hard work and, and clever work of the staff in the community for more than a year and brought that to fruition. I was, I was very, very proud of that. Uh, we also, in, in kind of transition to the community, you know, we do try to be good neighbors. You know, we realize that we deliver a tremendous, tremendous amount of economic benefit to the city and to the community, but we also have negative uh, impacts, and we know that. At our heart, we're a, a large industrial use. I mean, that, that's just, that's what we are. Uh, and so we have to do what we can to mitigate those negative impacts and while well, accentuating the positive. And one of the ways over the years that we've, we've helped to mitigate the negative impacts is the residential sound insulation program. Uh, the first round of this started more than 30 years ago in 1992, uh, but some people missed, uh, missed the opportunity. They either chose not to participate or, or made other decisions. So we're starting a second round of this program in Council District 11 and Council District 8, as well as the city of El Segundo. And there's more than 2,000 eligible dwelling units. Uh, the, the work on that project actually is not just a soundbite. The work actually started last month. Uh, and we're actually working on uh, extra outreach because because we have people who are skeptical of, of, of the program. They don't really, it's almost too good to be true. So we're working extra hard to convince these residents to take advantage of the program. I mean, it, it seems strange, but there are many who are, who are distrustful uh, of, of the city. They're distrustful of the airport, or they're distrustful of somebody knocking on their door, offering them free things. And I, I can't say that I blame them in many ways. So we're having to do a lot of extra outreach to make sure that they fully understand the benefits of the program and have the opportunity to, to take advantage of it as they so choose. Uh, the other thing uh, we've we continue to do is a 
program called Hire LAX, and, and I think many of you are familiar with this, but it provides local members of the community, many of whom have significant impediments uh, to, to being employed, and it gives them entry-level training that leads to work in the construction trades at LAX. And to date, we've had 398 uh, people graduate from our apprenticeship readiness program, and they're now earning an average hourly wage of four, more than $45. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of that. That's a good living wage uh, that people can provide for their families with. Uh, you know, I've, I've been impressed. I learned about this program during my search process. I was I was very impressed, and it, it really is actually changing lives. It's changing. It's only changed 398 lives. So our challenge is to scale that. that that's important. And for those 398 people, it was life-changing. But we have millions of other people who, who need a similar opportunity. Uh, so we, we, well, we're proud of that program. We need to do more, and we need to scale that. Uh, if any of you are interested in the program, uh, we have a graduation uh, that I will be attending on March 28th at Los Angeles. Southwest College, and I invite any of you uh, to join me at that graduation and, and see the actual people who are benefiting uh, from this program. And uh, the other thing is, is the front door to Los Angeles. We need to provide a, a gold standard experience uh, for, our, for our visitors, for our guests. And so we continue, while we're doing some of the things I've described in the last few minutes, we're also hard at work on other uh, signature projects, including the LAMP, uh, with the automated people mover and the consolidated rental car facility. Uh, if you haven't seen these projects, I, I invite you to come out uh, and see them with your own eyes. Uh, we had Council President Kikorian uh, out uh, earlier this month. Uh, he visited the Conrack, and I, I would not put words in his mouth, obviously, but I think he was impressed. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that is the second largest concrete structure in the country. Uh, number one's the Pentagon, if, if you're wondering. It's the largest facility of its kind on the planet. There's, there's a number of things that that is, that that is the biggest and best at. I actually uh, uh, called some of my uh, former colleagues uh, in Texas and said that, you know, you you think everything's bigger in Texas, but uh, we, we have you yeah, in LA because uh, we have the, the biggest contracts. I've had a little fun with, with some people on that, but it's, it's really an impressive project and uh, council member Kikorian uh, coming out and being able to see that, you know, with his own eyes and put his own actual boots uh, on the ground, I think meant something to him. So I would invite all of you to come out uh, and see that for yourself. Uh, we're also uh, getting to work on a lot of other projects, including airfield work that we really need to do uh, to enable this, uh, continue the safe and efficient movement of airplanes. We have a very congested uh, airport. Uh, I'm, I'm learning just how congested it is. I thought I knew, but uh, now I'm, I'm really learning. Uh, so these projects are really critical to, to maintaining the high levels of safety uh, that, that our customers deserve. Uh, we're also focused uh, in Van Nuys and, and working with elected officials, the community, and our tenants there to provide a, a modern facility, a, a modern airport that benefits the community and the, and the businesses who use that community. Uh, so just to close, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to join a, a city like Los Angeles, uh, an airport uh, like LAX and Van Nuys. Uh, and today your committee is going to consider a number. I, I think you, you already have them on consent. Thank you. But you're going to consider a number of really high profile items that are really crucial to our ongoing success and our ability to deliver the economic impact that, that this city uh, deserves. And these include uh, alternate delivery ordinances to help us uh, get some of our projects going, the Maytag contracts that I previously mentioned and some digital experience contracts and all of these are critical for the continued transformation of LAX and I have members of my executive team here to answer questions on those should you have any questions and that concludes my remarks. Wow. Well, thank you for that action-packed update. It seems like it has been a really busy um, six weeks or so. Um, thank you for all of the updates and everything that you covered with us. Um, I was really encouraged to hear um, that you're getting new and first time primes and new businesses into LAWA and into LAX. This is work that is a priority of our council and this committee and ensuring that we are creating those opportunities and really seeing that return on investment is music to my ears. Um, also, thank you for the mention of the higher LAX program. I, I just, it is so rewarding to hear that those programs are paying off. And I know that these opportunities do in fact change lives. Um, if we have any constituents in CD11 or CD8 who are um, listening to the meeting and you've heard about the sound installation opportunities, I personally was down at the showroom um, at LAWA when those um, were being exhibited. These are absolutely gorgeous additions that folks can make to their homes. 
Not only will it improve your property values, but it really makes a huge impact with the noise. So I have previously passed that information on to the council member from CD8. I will do that again. Um, and so I really would encourage folks to qualify for um, the opportunities to avail themselves um, of these programs. Um, you, like I said, you really covered a, a lot. Um, I think Mr. Ackerman, as you know, I was just recently in Paris and then in Tokyo um, meeting with government officials about Olympics and preparations and things that are necessary there. And I've come home with my own to-do list that is now a mile long. And obviously some of the big infrastructure capital improvement projects around LAX are top of mind and having those completed in time for upcoming events is really important. Um, I know you haven't been there long, but in thinking about the work that needs to be done to get us ready for World Cup in 2026, which is terrifyingly close around the corner, what are some of the top priorities that you can think of that might be able to help us keep this work moving forward urgently so that we are ready when the time comes? So thank you for the question and thank you for the uh, sound insulation commercial. I appreciate that. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the elephant in the room is obviously the people mover project, which is which is behind schedule. Uh, so it's a it's a priority to get that moving uh, and get that project uh, back on track. Pun intended. Uh, we, we we need that. You know, we the congestion in the central terminal area is you know something that I experienced as a customer for many years, and and I hear it from every single person I tell about this job, the first thing I hear is the central terminal area and the congestion. So that is that is a huge priority for us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the employee experience is, is a priority. Uh, I candidly think that our employees are, they have been extraordinarily successful uh, because of their dedication, because of their intelligence, because of their passion. But in some cases, it's been in spite of the systems that have been placed around them. Uh, and that's lots of different systems. So I'm not talking about anything in specific, but but it, it's reached a point where they're struggling now. I mean, we're 20% we're down, and I know there are other city departments who are suffering worse, so I'm not I'm not asking for sympathy, but, you know, when, when you have staffing levels that are at, at those levels for that long a period of time, it can be difficult to recover from. So I'm very focused on how we can better that, that employee value proposition and, and build a better ex experience for our employees because I believe, you know, throughout most of my business life that if you don't enable your employees to succeed, there's no way they can take care of your customers. You know, there's no way they'll take care of investors and, you know, the, the whole thing breaks down. So my primary focus right now is on taking care of the, the LAWA team members, to be honest with you. And that is everything from figuring out how to hire more of them uh, because it's very difficult to hire. Uh, we're, the, the progress towards filling that, that deficit is much slower than, than I would like. So we need to figure out how to accelerate that. Uh, they also need better working conditions. Uh, the, again, I, I've asked the team to, to rethink the, the balance between building new assets and, and maintaining the assets that we have. I think that our, our asset base is in some ways outstripped our customer, our employee base, and we need to, to, to write that equation. So kind of rebalancing the priority between, you know, building new things, which are great, and everybody loves to do it, but you have to take care of what you have. So I would say those are my key priorities right now. Oh, well, thank you for all of that. Those are three excellent priorities, and I don't mean to speak for the entire committee, but I suspect we would all concur with those as being very important to all of us. Um, but you did say, tie, uh, say a couple things that I think tie into the next question I wanted to ask, and this is both sort of related to the people mover and congestion in the central terminal area. Um, over this past weekend, we heard reports of very serious traffic in and around the airport. We, there were headlines of people actually getting out of their cars and walking into the central terminal area. Um, that's not a headline that any of us particularly want to see, and I think it may have been exacerbated by a lack of communication. So just curious if you can give us some insight if you happen to know what happened, what, what went on, and what are we doing to prevent that from happening again? So thank you for that. So so it, it was it was unacceptable for our customers. It was unacceptable for for people in the neighborhood who were trying to get to get through there. It was it was not a good day for for LAX. 
Uh, we're still reviewing the, you know, kind of doing a, a, a debrief on, on what happened, but at a high level, uh, we are obviously trying to do a lot of work in that area. There was work going on overnight Saturday that was supposed to be completed by early Sunday morning, and it did not get completed in time. Uh, and we struck the central terminal area with, with road closures, the central terminal area, the, the remaining roads simply just couldn't physically handle the traffic in the central terminal area. Uh, we realized that actually fairly early on Sunday, uh, but would, if you just, uh, the, the physics of a traffic event like that, it's kind of if you filled your bathtub and the bathtub's full, you can pull the plug out of the bottom, but it's just, it just takes a certain amount of time for the water to drain out. So literally that was kind of, we, we fixed the clog fairly early in the problem and it just took a lot of time to get things moving after that. Again, completely unacceptable uh, and this is not what our customers should expect. It's not what our citizens should expect, uh, but that's the, that's the in a nutshell what happened. We're getting into more detail and we're going to put in place, uh, we've actually directed the construction teams that cause that problem are not allowed to do any more of that until we're satisfied that they can successfully do it right the next time. Thank you for that insight. I may ask you again next time I see you if you've had a chance to finish your briefing on it. But I definitely understand it's a bit like waiting for the Panama Canal to drain sometimes to, to clear the log jam in there. Um, but we do appreciate the attention on it. I don't have any other questions. So Council Member Soto Martinez, anything? Um, I, don't, I have some good advice to you, Mike, if you want to be first. Uh, first of all, I'm all for draining the Panama Canal. That'd be <laughs> Uh, just really, really quickly, I know that the uh, installation program goes to El Segundo as well. Um, how is the relationship with El Segundo? Have you found that so far? That's uh, a point of uh, contention and, and relationship, and it's gone in cycles. Well, what would be your assessment? And if you're not ready to tell me, don't worry. I'm happy to give you my initial assessment. Uh, myself and, and some of my senior leaders I met with uh, the city manager for El Segundo and the mayor of El Segundo about two weeks ago. Uh -huh. uh, I thought we had a, an excellent meeting. It was, as far as I could tell, I mean, if it, there, I, I know there's a history in a lot of places here, but none of it was evident uh, on, on that day. Uh, we talked constructively about, you know, things that we're doing going forward that will, we think will benefit El Segundo. Uh, we talked a lot about yeah. Imperial uh, and how we can work together to make that Imperial uh, corridor, I guess, uh, better. And we did talk about the residential sound installation program. So uh, from my perspective, it was an excellent meeting. Great. That's great. Thank you. I have nothing else. Cool. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for this presentation, your first presentation. Uh, I'm sure the six months have been uh, like drinking fire out of uh, uh, water out of a fire hose. That's what everyone told me when I was this for the first time. Um, but I'm really glad to hear that you are thinking about the workers and how you know difficult it is to be there when it's 20% vacancies and centering them, and that makes me very happy. The door-to-door, -door, uh, going door-to-door, -door, talking to folks about the sound installations is phenomenal. I mean, I think we 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 need to. There's you can always improve on outreach and making sure people are connected to you know one of our largest assets. So I want to I want to give you your flowers for that. Um, uh, I definitely want to go to the graduation uh, on the 28th. I think that would be really incredible to see. Um, places, are there any places where we could be helpful uh, in the council, especially on the hiring? On the hiring? Um, and, and I'll say this because we, um, in another committee, uh, there's a, well, actually, on the personnel committee, uh, Councilman McCosker, I think, has done a really good job of trying to accelerate the hiring uh, through TLH and doing job fairs. Uh, and so I think there's could be some good practices to, to learn from that. We, we've been pushing very uh, diligently to allow workers to come uh, or applicants to come and in that one day leave with a job um, because it's just so hard to mm -hmm. go through the whole process. So I think there's a place where perhaps we can maybe be supportive of that. And then in the other, in another, I think in this committee, yeah, this committee, um, trying to get the work source centers uh, more connected to uh, to the jobs, and um, uh, we're doing a redesign so that we can support with the unions and try to get more, not just the trades, but other unions are out there that could feed into the job. So uh, that's a place where we can try to support. If you want, we can chat offline. But uh, I, I say that because when I first got here, it's hard to see the whole the whole picture. I still don't know the whole picture, but 
I think I got like a, a few months ahead of you, so I'm trying to put that in front of you so so that uh, we can all you know we can all work towards the same goal. So, uh, but yeah, just very happy with the report. Uh, if you need some support on those things, happy to to also be a partner in that. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to see you on the 28th, and perhaps we can chat offline. Uh, maybe we got some time before or after there. As far as what uh, what the committee or what council can do to help, I, I think I'll. Uh, I, I am new, so I, I don't think I have the big picture yet. I guess what I would say and, and what I've been telling people ask similar questions is it's, it's coming in from the outside. You know, nothing ever looks what, like what you think it is from the outside when you're inside. So uh, I'm learning. Uh, what I will say is that I, I think we're at a point where it's, it's taken a long time for us to get here. But when you have a city that is this far down on personnel across the city, uh, you know, we, we all read the CAO memo from a few weeks ago when the new when the new uh, agreement was signed. Um, I, I think the city's at an interesting inflection point, and and I what I've what I've said is that I think that you know uh, you know myself and my leadership team, uh, union leadership, the mayor's leadership, council leadership, CAO. I think a lot of a lot of us got us here over the last 40 or 50 years or whatever it was, and it's going to take all of us working together uh, to get us on a better trajectory. But but right now, I, I do have concerns in, in hiring. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned people. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult to hire people. It's extraordinarily slow. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of things we could do to, to speed that up. Uh, again, I started off saying I spend most of my time thinking and talking about people. And candidly, in my previous job, I spent more time talking about talent, getting talent, retraining talent, uh, retaining talent, developing talent, and, and, and helping those people. Here, I spend more of my time talking about why it's not possible or why it takes too, so long. And, and that's difficult. Uh, you know, and again, I'm not I'm not asking for sympathy. It's it's my job as a leader with with you and the other leaders in the city to try to figure out a way out of this. But but I do think, you know, the, the first thing you have to do is recognize that you have a problem. And and I hope there is recognition of that, because I think there's some serious structural challenges uh, that, that face, you know, face my department and, and face the city. And this is a competitive world, you know. Uh, you know, my team competes with airports. You know, we compete with my previous airport. I mean, I could show you slide presentations from that airport that have a lot of slides in it about this airport in this city. And uh, you know, you can you can guess what I had in those decks. But airports around the world. I'm just talking about my business. Airports around the world are doing the same thing. This is a very competitive business. Uh, the airlines that we try to attract, you know, their their major asset uh, go, is travels at 500 miles an hour and can be moved overnight to the other side of the planet where it'll make them more money. So we're in a very, very competitive business. And, and I think that we as a city need to recognize that and the things that work for us in, in kind of, you know, the just in a, in a bubble here might not translate. And there's other places in this country and other places in the world that are doing things a lot differently. Uh, and again, I'm not saying good, bad. I'm just saying they're doing things differently. Uh, and they have uh, in my opinion, fewer barriers to mm -hmm. to achieve the success that, that this city deserves. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you you have a, a pretty broad perspective on these things. I think uh, you know, I think we're all happy that you're in that role, and uh, and I think the way we do it is is collaboration. It's just collaboration and working towards the same thing. So, any way you know this committee can be supportive, I think we can you know, just ask. Thank you so much, Councilman. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Anything else? Okay, well, we really appreciate the appreciate the update. Um, and since this is a discussion item, I don't believe there is any action for us to take, which will bring us to item number two. The clerk, if you would please read the item. Item number two, Port of Los Angeles quarterly update. All right. Good to Hi, see ya. Uh, I, I can run. Well, either way, whatever works. Just kind of, can we flip in the middle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We appreciate you making the time to be here. I Always. just did um, a visit to the part, port of Nagoya. <laughs> Got to do a sister city visit and see what the other end of some of the incredible initiatives that you've been working on here in our city look like on the other side. Did you get to see Kamada San, the uh, chief executive of the port? I He's did. He's a dear friend of ours. Yeah. I did indeed. Great guy. Yes. 
So thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Looking forward to the update. Great. Thank you, Chair Park. Gene Soroka, Executive Director of Port of Los Angeles. I'm joined by Mike DiBernardo, Deputy Executive Director of Business Development and Customer Relations. Leading into this quarterly update, staff provided us with a number of subjects to cover with you all. Happy to uh, take comment, questions, thoughts for follow-up as we go through these. And I'll tell you as much as I know, but look forward to the conversation. Uh, first off, coined by our own council member from the 1-5 uh, McCosker, the Lamita punch-through concept. And broadly speaking, you'll see a map here up on the screen. Lamita Boulevard runs through uh, city of Los Angeles, county of Los Angeles, city of Carson. And it is an idea early on from the council member uh, after inauguration that maybe we could reroute some of this heavy industrial truck traffic through larger corridors then through our city streets, especially in the enclave of Wilmington. With the Infrastructure and Jobs Act bipartisan law uh, and the amount of money that's available for infrastructure projects throughout transportation networks, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act at the federal level, again, another source of opportunity for us to pursue and kind of knock down some walls that may have previously been there. The idea is to make a contiguous thoroughfare and hopefully move forward with, with rerouting cargo. Uh, we at the Port of Los Angeles is, have offered the council member any resource that would be available at the Harbor Department for his pursuit. I know that staff has joined you uh, on calls with Caltrans and others to try to start mapping out what is possible. And we've even gone so far as to recommend that if uh, a study, an official study is needed on transportation analysis, funding opportunities, traffic flows, et cetera, we'll bring all expertise that we can both inside and outside the department to assist. Next, also initiated by our council member were quiet zones. And I, I guess in grocery store language, this means that trains coming in and out of the port run through our neighborhoods, and especially in Wilmington. What can we do to evaluate how these trains run? And typically, they blare their horns as they go through cross streets and sections. Can we quiet this down, as, as the moniker would say, and put up other defense mechanisms, other alert systems that would not necessarily wake up our family and friends at all hours of the day and night? So along with the Bureau of Engineering here in the city of Los Angeles, LADOT and others, we've begun to study exactly what this could look like look like. And again, in layperson's terms, maybe it's putting a few more traffic crossing arms down with enough distance and separation. So vehicular traffic, pedestrians, and most importantly, those living along these rail lines would not hear these horns blaring. In the Harbor District itself, three areas have been identified at Grant Street, Denny Street, and L Street. And those we think we could move forward with pretty quickly. And as Mike DiBernardo says, it's putting two arms up on each side of the street as opposed to one. And it's working with our local short line railroad, the Pacific Harbor Line, and the two Western railroads, BNSF and the UP Railroad, Union Pacific Railroad, to work on necessary process procedures for their engineers, conductors, and captains. So there'll be more to come on those updates, but uh, encouraged nonetheless by the entire city coming together and working uh, with respect to our community members. And on that note, a lot of community input on this subject from the folks in Wilmington. Next subject is Arches, and this is the California uh, conglomerate of public and private sector involvement to pursue the Department, U.S. Department of Energy's hydrogen hub concept nationwide. And so proud that this partnership and the lead, uh, the lead applicant led by Angelina Galativa, the CEO of Arches, uh, won one of the seven hydrogen hubs as nominated by the Department of Energy. Uh, announced by Mayor Bass and Council Member McCosker back last year in October, I believe it was, uh, the state of California stands to earn $1.3 billion in grants to help manufacture, transport, store, and sell hydrogen in and around the transportation infrastructure agencies, as well as hopefully one day used by citizens in homes across the state. The 400 members of ARCHES include the University of California system, 
also led by California Governor Gavin Newsom's uh, business development arm known as GoBiz and their director, Dee Dee Myers, and then a cross-section of private sector interests, including utilities, uh, corporations in transport, building and trades, along with the ports in uh, the state of California. It's still early days on the notification of that grant award. Now it's about the doing. How are we going to manufacture this hydrogen and what will we need from an infrastructure standpoint to have it move through the industrial sectors down to consumers and other users? At this juncture, we believe at the Port of Los Angeles, this is going to be an extremely important part of our quest to get to zero emission port operations, whether it be the cargo handling equipment on the ground on the port 7,500 acres, all the way through to heavy duty class eight trucks. And even one day, although it's only a dream right now, to use hydrogen derivatives as fuel for these ocean going ships. There will be testing in this area along with other types of propulsion mechanisms, but extremely encouraged that at least we're in the game as one of seven, and we've got an opportunity to use this um, this apparatus now to really up our uh, up our standing. One area that we're going to have to learn a lot more about and work on much more diligently is that manufacturing sector in hydrogen. Many of the uh, advocates of zero emission, zero carbon technologies have shared with me directly that we want to manufacture and use green hydrogen. Now, only 1% of the world's manufacture is of that variety today, but there are many opportunities of how we can get there, even using solar power to help distill and create green hydrogen on micro levels. Think of microgrids uh, using rooftop solar or even at the ports complex itself. That may be a way we get after this early to understand and take some learnings on how that manufacturing processes work so we can scale up. So it's going to be a lot of a lot of interesting work ahead of us. But as you could tell from 400 members in Arches alone and so many people that use our roadways, freeways and our 11 municipal ports in the state of California, we'll have a lot of input and a lot of folks to work with and see how we can get there as fast as possible. Green shipping corridors were another concept. As we look to set the table for what a zero emission port could be, a lot of folks have to come into play, and it, it takes a lot of these codependencies and interdependencies to work through some of these ideas. One was identifying where pollution comes from, and I think dating back to 2017, when we updated our Clean Air Action Plan, as the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles have long collaborated, we thought we could get after trucks and cargo handling equipment. But we've learned a lot more in the seven years that have transpired, including how these categories all come to play. So just again, kind of taking it as I would talk to my neighbor, there are five categories of equipment that pollute our air in and around the port. And in order of the most pollutants, number one are the ocean going ships. And they are the great majority of pollution that happens in and around the port. And from our consideration, add to climate change around the world. This is not just a local issue. We're trying to broaden our reach beyond just the city boundaries. Second are the heavy duty trucks, some 20,000 that have the privilege to call on the ports. Most are small businesses and many are Gen Zero, Gen One Americans who own those small businesses trying to build a life and a family along with their, uh, their business interests here in Los Angeles. Third category are the locomotives that move all these big trains. We move in and out about 100 trains a day uh, out of the San Pedro Compl Bay Complex, and those trains are no less than three miles in length. So compared to many years ago, we now have multiple locomotives attached to each one of these trains because they're so big and they require so much power to move across the country. Fourth category are the harbor craft. And think about pilot boats, tugboats, and other official vessels that have to patrol the ports for safety, security, and operational reasons. And then way, way down on the list, although it's taken us a long time to understand this based on the science, is that cargo handling equipment. It's been shared with me by experts that California emits 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, and these terminal handling cargo unit equipment types emanate 1% of that 
So it's my view that we need to get after the big stuff as quickly as we can, although not losing our sights on what we've already committed to do and how we brought private sector together. So it's just a lot of learning and a lot of people that are giving really good advice and trying to back it with science and engineering to make sure that we know what we're doing. On the green shipping corridor, being the largest pollutant source, we have band together with no less than eight international ports across the Trans-Pacific Theater to see what it would look like to move cargo in a zero emissions fashion at origin, put it on a vessel that has no carbon, and then brings it here to Los Angeles to be handled in the same way. We've enlisted the help and support of major shipping lines around the world, including the top three to fashion an approach of alternative fuels that could propel these heavy cargo ships and get after the source categories of particulate matters to sulfur oxide, NOx, and the carbon effect or the greenhouse gases that they emit. Really pleased so far that leader CMA CGM out of Marseille, France has been bringing uh, liquid natural gas propelled ships into the port of Los Angeles for over a year, and I know that purists who have told me we don't like bridge technologies because it may slow us down to get to a pure zero environment is totally respected by that input. But we also have to see what technologies can work as we dive down into less and less carbon elements per vessel voyage per ton of fuel. So I'm pleased with that. We'll have another company that will be bringing in methane fuel ships later this year. Now, that may not get after all of the NOx emissions, but it will get us on a track maybe to look at e-methane or e-methanol that will get after that source category. So this is an iterative phase of steps, and I know some would like us to move faster. I would too. I've lived around in port cities almost all my life, but I like the momentum that we've got. And the green shipping corridors, if done the right way, even in early days, from Shanghai to Los Angeles, one of the biggest trade routes in the world, if we can reduce the emissions from that ship by 10%, that would be equivalent to all the emissions at the port of Los Angeles in one year. That's kind of what's at stake. Next topic was waterfront maintenance. When I came here in the summer of 2014, we had about a $950 million budget. What we'll put in front of council and city leaders later this, uh, uh, this springtime is a budget in exceedance of uh, exceeding $2 billion U.S. dollars. And that's been purposeful. We've tried to drive more cargo to raise revenue and create more jobs. With that money, we've tried to reinvest in our port, our community, and our environmental strategy. And thus far, with some ups and downs that are a little out of our control on occasion, we've done a pretty good job of that. One of the things that we've learned from community members, business leaders, neighborhood councils, residents, and faith leaders is they wanted closer access to the waterfront, more ability to get close to this port, have retail, dining, entertainment, green spaces. With that comes more need to make sure that the beautification of these green spaces is up to our standards. So the council member has asked us on numerous occasions to make sure that we chart out a plan to keep up these properties. We just opened the Wilmington Waterfront Promenade last month. Uh, on the uh, ahead of the opening of Lunar New Year. Uh, the Wilmington Waterfront Park has been a staple now for about nine years, and we've done some great work on the San Pedro side as well with the West Harbor development on the retail commercialization. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen tagging of certain areas with respect to graffiti. We've seen weeds grow faster than we can keep them down because of the uh, um, uh, the health impacts of the chemical product roundup requiring more maintenance from a labor perspective and a litany of other issues. So it is front of mind to us in our planning. One of the areas of high turnover in our department is the gardener caretaker position. And while we're trying everything we can, just as John Ackerman said, from targeted local hiring to other city initiatives, we're trying to get folks in as quickly as we can. But once those skills are built, these are folks that are very attractive, not only in our department, 
but to other city departments and even in the private sector. So we're doing, a, I think we're doing a really commendable job on attracting, recruiting, and retaining talent. We've just got to do more of this now because we've got so much more public space to care for. But it's right in the front of, uh, right in the front of our strategy, and we'll be assured to keep this committee and Councilman McCosker updated on our progress there. Cruise terminal traffic. This is another area of our business that we wanted to grow because for every cruise ship that calls the Port of Los Angeles, it means about $1.3 million to our local economy. Think about the small shop owners, the restaurants, the hotels, the dry cleaners, and everybody that does business and counts on the port to develop their business even further. In 2023 calendar year, we had about 239 vessel calls, which was double what it was pre-COVID. Folks want to get back out on the high seas and go to their cruise destinations. And we also were privileged to serve more than 1.3 million passengers, the highest number of visitors from the cruise sector since 2008. All of that means more cars because we're the largest drive market in the country for the cruise industry. They see this sprawling Southland region with 20 million of us residents as folks who can jump in a car at lunchtime in Riverside, drive down to the port, check in for the vessel for an evening time departure to the Mexico Riviera. So we're doing a couple things. One, infrastructure. Ingress and egress off the Vincent Thomas Bridge, State Road number 47 will keep traffic at a wider spread away from that narrow bottleneck that exists today. Coming in and out of that particular bridge is just one way into the cruise center and one way out. So spreading the playing field a little bit for the passenger traffic is job number one. It'll also take the industrial truck traffic at farther distances to the north side. For example, going into the West Basin Container Terminal and then up and around to the Trey Pack facility off Harry Bridges Boulevard. So that planning is, is in place right now and the construction work design phase is complete, construction work is beginning. Next piece is how we band together all of the agencies to help direct traffic and move the traffic around at the necessities that it requires. Most of the cruise lines want to call on the weekends because that's when people are free from work and they want to go on their three-day cruises. Trying to spread that out with the cruise lines is also part of what we're doing in our exploration of an outer cruise terminal outside Berth 46 that will go out for public bidding later this year. And then lastly, trying to move around the business of the cruise terminal a little bit differently. How folks deliver the food, groceries, or what we call stores in that area has been met with mixed results so far, and some of the early and late deliveries haven't gone over so well, but we're going to keep chipping away at that to keep that industrial segment of business flowing the way it should, but not impacting commuter traffic and school buses and the folks that need to get where they're going every day. I think there'll be more studies in this area as well, but with more business comes more complication, but more opportunity for, uh, for improvement. So we'll keep you posted on that. Not from, at least from what I've learned through our discussions and with staff, there's not one lever we can pull that'll alleviate traffic bottlenecks, but some of this work should preclude the density of traffic that we've been witnessing recently with the uptick in business. And I think those were the topics I was asked to discuss. I think I've gone a little bit over the allotted time, my apologies, but open to any, uh, any other conversation, questions or follow-up that you all would like. Um, Mr. Soroka, thank you, as always, for the jam-packed update. You actually answered a lot of my questions just with the material that you covered. Um, seems like the cruise passenger volume is looking good. We talked about some of the sustainability initiatives with our trade partners and our commercial shipping corridors. Can you talk to us a little bit about sustainability initiatives that we're working on at the port as it relates to the cruise lines? Yeah, I, if one thing comes to mind is that back in two th uh, early 2000, we created the first ever alternative marine power concept. And this was simply plugging from the DWP's electrical grid into a ship where those vessels could turn off their auxiliary engines, saving about 1,500 tons of pollution per vessel call. That has moved over to the cruise business. Now it's a different engineering design. Uh, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but you need about 11, 11.5 kilovolts for a cruise ship and a container ship is around 
half of that, right? Because you've got so many people on there. They're drawing electricity and power and hot water, et cetera. So we still are the first port in the world, not only to do the alternative marine power for the, uh, the containerized cargo business, but the cruise business. Next will be bulk cargo and liquid bulk. Think of the big tankers that come through as well. A little bit difficult working with electrons and molecules or putting electricity against something that's flammable, but we've got extra work to do there. Moving the stores, as I mentioned, the grocery products, linens, and things that the, uh, the cruise ships will need via zero emissions and, and electric or hydrogen powered trucks is also in the offing by the service providers that, uh, that work with us on that business every day as well. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that we're looking at both categories of business. And I just want to commend you again for the forward thinking as it relates to hydrogen technology. I think as a long-term policy matter and investment, folks really are interested in green hydrogen. We understand that the technology just isn't there at scale and capacity yet. And so I appreciate the creative thinking about repurposing of our own infrastructure and our own gas pipelines as we are blending hydrogen with natural gas. Um, as we work through scaling the technology. So I just want to, again, thank you. And after having been in Nagoya and after having seen the, the push to hydrogen in other places and the incredible advancements that are being made with it, I am hopeful that um, we will continue to see the same um, momentum here. So I don't have any other questions, Councilmember McCosker. I have a couple. Sure you do. <laughs> uh, I'll just go through this, the slides in your order. Thanks very much, um, uh, Mr. Soroka. I really appreciate it. And Mike, thank you for being here. Um, on the Lameda punch through, um, thanks for helping me coin that phrase. Marketing yeah, is happening. Yeah, yeah. People half understand job. this. Yeah. yeah. You now people totally get it. Um, I have had the chance to sit with, as you know, you you named off some of the folks. Sat with the the mayor and and in D.C. had a chance to speak with the lobbyist about it and I think we're heading on our way but we do need the plans so yes. basically the, the the description of it with some competency and so that transfer of of um, of assistance uh, from your department over to engineering and DOT would be of great help because we're racing to get to the call for projects for Metro okay do you have That's a timeline that, on that yeah it's good we're gonna have to have a verbal description of the middle of next month okay by the 20th I think and then okay. a but don't quote me on that. Well, I'll get to you offline. We have to have a verbal description and sort of a plan for how we can put it together. And we have an estimate of what it would cost to sort of scope it and out. And who's going to lead the study? There's a, a consultant that is on to be on the bench as hmm. soon as the council approves the bench okay. for DOT. DOT has a consultant gotcha. that's been working on the 47 okay. exchange. You know, Correct. all that work that, that all of the work that went into the 47 and the corridor up through the southeast cities. Right. All of that, it would, that, that consultant is not only available and interested and intrigued, but is also on a prospective bench for the DOT. Fantastic. Okay. That's good. So we can do that. On, uh, on the quiet zones, I know we're having meetings. I just wanted to thank you for that. I want to keep that one moving. And I do think it would be important for us to keep an eye on whatever we do with the three McFarland line uh, exchanges can be a city model because they're hmm. outside of, sure. of impacts by the port. There's a whole bunch of opportunities throughout, all the way through the valley. And these typically, these lines are running through port neighborhoods who deserve better. All yeah, we didn't put any, we didn't want to put any lines of demarcation, but these three particular intersections were part of the Harbor District. So yeah. it gave us a little bit more uh, oversight capability, yeah. but we're happy to collaborate and share best practices with whomever you see fit. Yeah, and I will be very interested when we get through this list of three to see how it can affect our the real issue we have um, uh, with Rancho, the Rancho uh, tanks. It's yes. a larger issue than the rail, but to look at the rail and to look at the trucking situation and to look at the Rancho tanks. So this is going to lead to us to Rancho. Happy to keep discussing that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really, I'm excited for Arches and I, I, our chairperson, uh, raised all of the issues that I totally agree with. Um, on the green shipping corridor, so for us to for us to affect this, are we are we using this in our our are we leveraging our position in the market to um, to push this along with leases and with terminal agreements and with you know basically using our role as a market participant 
to urge this along, or is this something that's happening at a, a higher policy level between the Pacific Rim and us? It's a really high policy level started by the C40 group of cities uh, that was so instrumental in getting us put back together with the Paris Agreement when the previous administration in Washington pulled us out. That gave us the impetus to use the relationship at the municipal level across, across the globe tighten it down to the Trans-Pacific region with which we do most of our business and bring friendly cities together. So for example, um, Shanghai will be our first that, corridor uh, partner that we implement this with because it's the largest volume place and they're the most progressive. We've had a relationship with the Shanghai municipality, ports and, and others in the city for better part of 25 years. Second is with Singapore because they are known as the energy hub in our marine transportation industry. Yeah. And we think that their knowledge, capabilities, and convening powers can help bring about the, the greener uh, propulsion mechanisms and energy products much quicker than we could do it on our own. Right. So that's kind of the concept. Now, if these tests, if these pilots, if these best practices become scalable, can we leverage that into contractual relationships? Yeah, possibly. I just don't know yet how that would work, but we have some precedent. For example, dating back to the work that Mike DiBernardo, Eric Harris, and others have done on vessel speed reduction, mm -hmm. the emissions control area that goes off the California coast by 200 miles that was then adopted by Canada shortly thereafter. Yeah. We've got a number of ways that we can take good historical practices and modernize them. Those those types of things, that's a great example. When when Mike worked on and others worked on that, um, we had across the San Pedro Bay, we had both of the large players on the same page. How do we, are we working closely with Long Beach on this Yes, we are. Each each one of these memorandums of understanding that we put together with our overseas partners includes the Port of Long Beach. And our staffs are working daily on this and other environmental strategy matters. And there's no, for zero carbon, I mean, there's really no definition of what it is. And so it, it, it could be any number of things. And we won't be driving this discussion if it becomes hydrogen as to whether or not it's green, gray, or blue. Well, we'll be at the table with everybody. Our relationships in this industry run deep from my 11 years overseas to Mike's, and Mike and me working in this industry for three and a half decades and more. Uh, we'll be at the table with every discussion. We've got great and deep relationships. And realistically speaking, it's gonna take that private sector capital and ingenuity to be able to move this forward. But I, I give you a case in point. The ships that are, the modern ships that are being built in the container business have two gas tanks. Mm -hmm. And in current markets, what you can do is put your traditional fuel in one tank and the low sulfur fuel that's required to come to California in another, and you got a valve that switches between the two. By traditional, you mean bunker. Yes, correct. Very heavy, 780 density bunker fuel that you can throw a golf ball into a tub and it won't sink. Yeah. Really, really fossil fuel propulsion. Yeah. Now, as we move into LNG, the CMA, CGM company is putting their LNG product in, into one gas tank and they're having the traditional bunker in the other tank because if failure happens, you don't want that behemoth of a vessel with a 20 member crew sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean stranded. Yeah. Right? Same thing will be tested with methanol as those vessels come in. Yeah. And as the quality improves, as the technology improves, you'll be able to store that product, that new greener product in those in both of those tanks. Again, you're not having to go back to a shipyard and rebuild or repurpose an existing vessel. Right. You can keep up with the technology based on the ingenuity those shipyards have created for us. Right. Madam Chair, if I can add one, one more thing as well. We we have four, that's okay, four, four uh, subgroups that are working on the Shanghai. Yeah. And actually, Christine Peterson is going to be involved as, on one of the subcommittees on the fuel source. Great, great. Uh, which is good. So she's going to be a co-chair uh, with the other entities that are that are the chair. That's great. Would this be a, a, a for a quick moment? Could you just give us an overview of the announcement at EPA the other day of the three billion dollars? It's not directly related, but on this slide, you captured all of the the issues and all of the five sort of. Uh, danger points for us on carbon emissions. Can you tell us how we're yeah, going to This apply? is really important too. We talked a little bit ago about the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act. The Environmental Protection Agency now is open for applications on three billion US dollars of grants under two main categories. 
the Clean Ports Program nationwide, and the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants. So in essence, for folks like us, it means that there's going to be money available for both the infrastructure of getting ports to zero emissions and the equipment that moves the cargo. Each applicant will have a ceiling or a max allowable request of $500 million mm -hmm. in that $3 billion. We have been underweight in grants through both the IIJA and the IRA to date. Money has been sprinkled around the country and not necessarily just focused on our Southern California ports that, that manage 40% of the nation's imports. So we're trying to give everything we've got on this. We're working close with our friends at Long Beach, California authorities, air regulators, and the EPA itself. In fact, Administrator Michael Regan from the EPA made his second visit that you attended just last week to the Port of Los Angeles. So this is another big chunk of money to help advance our quest to get to zero. But the interesting thing, and I think the Administrator pointed it out in the press conference section, to turn our goods movement sector in Southern California to a zero emission equivalent may take 50, 80, 100 billion US dollars. I really don't know because a lot of the technology is not quite there yet and commercially available that you put a price tag on, right? So a lot of these are estimates right now. This money has never been considered from the federal or state level to solve all of that. It's really meant to get folks like us who are so progressive into the game and give confidence to the private sector to come behind that with the institutional knowledge, the scientists, the engineers, and the real capital and to attract other capital right. to get into this investment. But this EPA series of grants, is it, it's our Super Bowl. I guess the simple question I was going to ask is, we're going to apply. thousand percent. We're apply for 500 million. Yes, we are. And we're going to have community partners because I think that's what it takes. Oh, absolutely the right across the board. From, from EJ groups to organized, uh, organized groups like neighborhood councils that we work with every day uh, to faith, community, and business leaders. We've got to have everybody going and pulling in the same direction. That's right. And we'll, we'll work with your staff as always every stretch of the way. And the, um, the applications, um, council member, are due May 28th. Oh, May. Oh, yes. I thought they were in, uh, in April. Good, yeah, good. May 20th. Good, good, good. Yeah. Um, on waterfront maintenance, this is a simple one, but I mean, simple and... But it's a big deal. But it's a big deal. Yeah. And I know it's hard to retain folks, but, you know, with, with the, your great work and moving on to the next connector, you know, connecting the, the promenade to the park to the... To oh, the, the pedestrian Avalon. bridge has already received, I think we reported $58 million in grants yeah. coupled with our money to expedite that project. It's going to be something connecting that waterfront to Alameda and Avalon and building up that business district again. It's going to be great. But it's, it is another example of, ha of where we're going to need maintenance and, yeah. and folks to, to work the... What I also I like on that subject course. too is that whether it's community members or Sergio or... or Guys and ladies from your staff, if there's something out there, even Commissioner Lee Williams, take a picture, send us a text, let us get on it. We're, we're scouring the map every day, but it's been great to see the collaboration on that front and just, hey, I saw it, telling you guys, let's get out there and, and take care of it. So we really appreciate the input. 311 has a weird glitch in it for your property, though. Mm. It's not easy to identify an address because mm. you have That's wide right. swaths of property. You take yeah, a picture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we took 25 pictures along the waterfront and sent them in, and it's really hard right. for your guys to find them. They have to go out. Do you have any recommendations search. on how we could zone in better? Yeah, we've been talking to ITA about how we can maybe come up with a, a way to identify this, the exact spot. Okay. The chair raised the, the real issue, and that's environmental stewardship through the cruise industry. Yeah. As we're going out to this next RFP, where we're going to probably double our cruise work, are right. we are we paying attention to focusing on, you know, scoring towards folks that are coming up with those alternatives? I mean, a cruise ship would be it's hard to plug in because we don't have that much power, but it would be a great place for them to have their own cogeneration <laughs> plants. They have access to water. They have access to sun. They have access to create their own energy. Is that something we're going to focus on? A comprehensive look at not only what, what is available today, but what tomorrow could bring. Even the engineering school, Sam Welly at, at UCLA, 
is developing the prototype for what looks like a 20 foot container. And that could be a mobile amp product that rests on a ship traversing all the way across the Pacific or down to Mexico and back for the cruise industry. So yeah, we're trying to be as creative as possible. And we'll keep, again, we'll keep you guys, your staff in, um, in lockstep with us as we go through. Mike, when is that RFP expected to go out? Should be going out to the third quarter of this year. Third quarter, okay, good. And that's for the outer, the that's outer. for the outer harbor cruise terminal. That's correct. Terminal. Uh, so we got plenty of time for, for additional and more input. Absolutely. And we, you may remember that we did a draft RFP to go out to the marketplace, market sounding, if you will, to try to make sure we get our bearings. Because it's like it's, an RFI kind of thing, right? And yes. they all yeah. came up with their, yeah. they're all put yeah. together. Their they put in ideas like this that yeah. are a little more forward thinking. And as I've told you before, I don't know what I don't know. So that's why we gotta keep asking the questions yeah. and make sure we take this input. And the very last thing, and thank you so much for your patience, Madam Chair. The very last thing is, um, it won't be a question, but I just, I'm looking forward to the report when you come back and tell me a little bit about the leasing policy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I just passed that full council of the leasing policy and, and how we plug into the leasing policy and analysis of jobs, jobs lost, jobs gained, are we neutral? And again, as I said on the floor last week, it's not to say that we are dictating how these those decisions should go, but we need to walk into them with our eyes wide open. And I do know that logistics companies are smart enough to know what's happening with jobs. And so they can't tell us, I don't know. And, and shame on us, we can't accept that answer. Yeah, understood completely. Saw the tape of, of your comments last week. Thank you. Uh, in our application process, we do ask for a disposition on jobs and a, a laser focus on that area, as you and I have discussed many times since you took office, is very important to so many people. We understand. Thank you so much. It, if I can go back to the Wilmington, just I just yeah. want to give kudos to Water and Power and, and Michael Samalon from the mayor's office because every week we have a meeting between DWP, the port, and Michael Samalon to get that property exchange in order. So he's doing a great job and DWP is working with us very close on it. So just wanted to point that out. Great. Thank you. Sam. All right. Well, thank you so much. No questions for you? Okay. All right. Um, so thank you for that. Since this was just a discussion item, there is no action to, to be taken at this time. Um, that is going to bring us to items three to five. Mr. Shroko, I'm going to have you hang on just real quick. Um, sure. I have thoroughly read those items, but I did want to give my colleagues an opportunity to at least ask questions. Um, and Mr. Clerk, I'll have you read those three to five for us, please. Item three, Board of Harbor Commissioners and City Attorney reports an ordinance relative to Port of Los Angeles Resolution Number 23-10235 and proposed Permanent Order Number 23-7352 amending POLA Tariff Number 4 to modify rates and regulations in Section 7 free time to wharf demurrage and wharf storage items 720 and 780 to modify free time allowed on inbound containerized merchandise and wharf demurrage charges effective October 1st, 2023. Item four, Board of Harbor Commissioners and City Attorney reports an ordinance relative to Port of Los Angeles Resolution Number 23-10213 and proposed permanent order number 23-7348 amending POLA tariff number four with a general rate increase of 6.2% effective September 1st, 2023. And item number five, Board of Harbor Commissioners and City Attorney reports an ordinance relative to the Port of Los Angeles Resolution number 23-10229 and proposed permanent order number 23-7350 amending POLA tariff number four to revise section six passenger fees item 600 to implement a five-year rate schedule with an annual 3% rate increase effective July 1st, 2024. All right, thank you for that. Um, so as I said, I've had an opportunity to, to study those and read them. I presume my colleagues have as well. I want to give you both an opportunity to ask questions. Once more, Costco. No, thank you. We have staff that comes to all your meetings and we follow this all the way through. I appreciate the importance of this. Thank you. All right, Council Member Soto Martinez, any questions? No okay, all right, well, thank you. Then um, I would move that we approve items three through five. If you would, Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Park? Yes. McCosker? Yes. Soto Martinez? Items three through five have now been approved. All right. Thank you. Thanks we for all the time today. It's a pleasure to have the port with us. Same here. Thank See you. you. Soon.
All right, so let's move on to item six and seven. Mr. Clerk, if you would please read those items for us. Item six, Board of Airport Commissioners and City Attorney reports an ordinance relative to allowing the BOAC to authorize the Chief Executive Officer of LAWA to utilize alternative delivery methods and a competitive sealed proposal selection process for the LA-28 and FIFA-26 readiness program and related projects at Los Angeles International Airport. And item seven, Board of Airport Commissioners and City Attorney reports an ordinance relative to allowing the BOAC to authorize the Chief Executive Officer of LAWA to utilize alternative delivery methods and a competitive sealed proposal selection process for the West Campus Redevelopment Program and related projects at LAX. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Messis. Thank you so much for being here, and we are looking forward to your presentation on these items. Thank you. So um, these ordinances will allow LAWA to use alternative delivery methods for some projects that are part of our capital improvement program. Specifically, that's to develop our West Campus, which I'll show you a, um, a graphic here on shortly, and also for some projects that will help us be ready for FIFA and for the Olympics. Um, the delivery methods are industry standard delivery methods um, used across all markets. Uh, we have also used them before very successfully. Uh, there's a chart on the oops, on the slide that is uh, shown here of past projects and also active projects. Um, many of them have been very, very successful. And the good news is that we've had lots of lessons learned for, from our past projects that we've been able to apply to our future projects. Uh, we just had training recently with the Design Build Institute of America for LAWA and also many of our city partners, so we all know how to do these methodologies in the best way possible. Thank you. So um, this is a, um, a site view of the West Campus. So this is an area between the two sets of runways that we have. Right now, it is not being used in the most efficient way. This is very valuable land for us that we could use for airside functions. Right now, we have employee parking. We have um, some old facilities that are at end of life that need to be demolished. And this could be much better utilized, for uh, example, for aircraft parking, which we have a great shortage of at LAWA, especially as we go into these big events where we're going to have a, a great need for overnight aircraft parking and for some common use facilities for our airlines. Um, this next slide uh, just shows you that we've done a lot of work around the terminals, but there are gaps between the projects that we have done or are doing. And this terminal refresh project will address all of those gaps. Uh, we're also going to be addressing some much needed asset management as far as replacing HVAC systems, fire and life safety systems. We're going to be doing some safety and security work uh, in preparation for these big events. And then we know that we're going to need some temporary facilities to support these big events, specifically the Olympics. And this, uh, this ordinance will allow us to do that in a very quick and efficient way. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. You know, having just returned from this delegation to Paris and sitting down and meeting with officials who are actually preparing to deliver the 2024 games, um, the need to get the city of Los Angeles ready in time for the 2028 Olympics already feels urgent, but you're right, the FIFA World Cup is, as I said earlier, scarily around the corner. And so there is a lot of work um, at LAX as the gateway and the entry point for so many people that are gonna be coming. It is so important that we ensure that LAX is gonna be able to handle the increased passenger loads and that you have the space and resources and tools and equipment um, that you need so that this really is a seamless experience for the millions of people that are going to be coming through LAX. And so in short, delivering on these investments on time is gonna be really essential. So can you talk to us just a little bit more about what delivery method LAWA is contemplating for the LA-28 and FIFA-28, uh, FIFA-26 readiness and West Campus redevelopment programs? Like, what is this gonna look like? And just talk to us a little bit more about what it entails. Sure, uh, most of the work that we're looking uh, at in the future is gonna be done through progressive design build. Okay. We've chosen this methodology because it allows for early collaboration between the contractor, the designer, and also the owner. 
and we're all working together to establish costs, scope, and, uh, and also to look at risk in a very transparent way so we go into construction um, much better informed and also prepared for um, the challenges that might lie ahead with that project. And hopefully incorporating some best practices from some other um, public-private partnerships that we've done and progressive design build opportunities that we've used because these, these days are going to go very, very quickly and um, I certainly have my own sense of purpose with a touch of panic <laughs> associated with the scope of what we need to do to get the city ready and um, you know, as LAX sort of being the front porch and the front door to our entire city, I appreciate the effort and the foresight that it is going to take. So um, I want to open it up to questions from my colleagues. Mr. McCosker, go ahead. Thank you. So good. Sort of at its core, if I understand it, this would be allowing us to do, allowing you as an organization to do um, an RFP process, select a, a proposer, and then in the, uh, the progressive nature of it is that you can then negotiate the rest of the contract, and which is really different, really different. It's faster, right? It is faster, yes. So we're able to get the entire team on board early, and we don't need to do a second procurement to bring on the contractor. They're already on board in this one procurement. It also allows us to choose teams on a best value approach, which is looking at their qualifications, experience, staffing, in addition to cost. So it gets away from the bid, and it gets away from the the you know, lowest bidder, obviously, and I'm yes. for best value. I, I, I think it's a real opportunity for us. What prevents us from it becoming effectively a sole source? I mean, how, what, what, what protects us so that you put the, RF, the offer uh, out to the world? Does it still go through Bavin or whatever we're calling Bavin now? Or how does it, how does it get advertised to the world? Sure. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of outreach at LAWA. Um, CEO Ackerman mentioned a little bit about that. Um, I think we've received the highest number of bids in the history of LAWA just as of recent. Yeah. So uh, a lot of outreach, uh, telling firms uh, what the scope is, how can they apply the timing so that they can prepare and also position themselves with their teams. Uh, and so we've seen a great response. So we don't believe that it'll be a sole source. I think uh, we've positioned ourselves as the owner of choice. Oh, no, I, I, I realize you do it, and I realize you want to do it, but is there anything in this model that, that makes sure that, the, that you will have an opportunity for a number of proposers? Like, what is the process? Let's say you want, you're going to do Project Y under this new process, and then you put out the proposal for Project Y. Is there anything about this process that requires it to be published somewhere or to be oh, yes. available somewhere? Yes, uh, uh, yes. So in addition to the outreach events, it goes on to Ramp LA, which is where the city posts all of their procurements. So it is open to the public. Anybody can come and propose. Uh, and it's required uh, to be on ramp. I mean, that's what I used to call it. Yes, ramp. yes. Uh, so yes. it's required to be on ramp. That's good. That's all I yes. wanted to know. Thank you. Yes. That's great. I mean, I think this is terrific. Council Member Soto Martinez? Yes, thank you so much, yep, Madam Chair. Um, how, can you just, uh, I just want to make sure that we are still going to have the ability to look at other qualifications, like their small businesses, yes. women-owned, uh, you know, people of color-owned. Like, is that you still still good with that? Yes, we have a really expansive inclusivity uh, requirement and also program. They have to submit an inclusivity plan. It includes that they have to do a mentorship, a mentor protege program throughout the course of their contract. Uh, they have to, they're required to hire interns. They're also required to hire our higher LAX graduates who've gone through that pre-apprenticeship program. Um, our PLA, which is 30% local hire, applies. And then the, we also set goals for business inclusion. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Terry. Really appreciate it. Uh, I don't think that there are any further questions. So with that, colleagues, I would move that we approve items six and seven. Mr. Clark, if you would, please call the roll. Park. Yes. McCosker. Yes. Soto Martinez. Yes. Three ayes and those items have been approved. Awesome. Do we have anything else pending before the committee today? The desk is clear. Okay. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.